want to invite you to turn uh, today to Luke chapter 23. Um, I want to share with you um, again today, so for three weeks now we've looked at uh, some people's encounters um, with Jesus, and we've looked at how Jesus is a seeking Savior, how Jesus is a celebrating Savior, um, how Jesus um, enters into people's life, and really the common theme here is that Jesus is always seeking and saving the lost. He says so himself. That was his mission here on earth. So I want to look at what I guess um, before Jesus' death was his last encounter um, with two people. And it's a pretty well-known story. In fact, if I put this picture up of Jesus between the two thieves, many of us know that. I realize it's not Easter, but I hope we're not surprised that if the gospel hinges on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that it's going to come up more than at Christmas and at Easter. Um, and so I do want to focus on that moment in Jesus' life right near the end before his death uh, here on earth and bef uh, before his resurrection, this interaction. So you know this story. We'll read um, just a small part of it in just a minute. But there's one thief uh, there on the cross that mocks Jesus and the other turns to Jesus in faith, apparently, from what he says here. And Jesus promises him, today you will be with me in paradise. Um, and I read one little humorous way, because sometimes we think about these things and we um, uh, take for granted, if you're like me and had the privilege of hearing these kind of stories your whole entire life, sometimes they lose the impact that they should have. Um, and this one, think about this man. In his dying moments now enters in to saving grace and salvation. And so um, a name you may recognize, a preacher named Alistair Begg, um, who I, I can commend to you his preaching and writing, but um, he says, you know, I always think about um, the relationship uh, that the thief on the cross would have with the other people in heaven. And he imagines this conversation when this thief enters into heaven. And somebody says, what are you doing here? And he says, well, I don't know. Well, who sent you here? Well, I don't know. Nobody sent me here. I'm just here. Well, are you? Have you been justified by faith? Do you have peace with God? He might say, I don't know. Well, do you know anything? And his response would be, yeah, I do know this. The man on the middle cross said I could be here. I like that because Jesus is at the center of this thing. Not what he did, but what Jesus did there. There's a lot of lessons we can learn from that, but let's read from Luke chapter 23. Uh, we're going to begin uh, reading with verse uh, 39. Now, I've entitled this Provoking Jesus. And like each week, I want you to see that it's very clear that there are people who provoked Jesus. Jesus. We're going to use another word that we're going to read in the Gospels here for that. But I also want you to know this, that Jesus, by his life, his death, his resurrection, and even more so by his claims to be both Savior and Lord, is a provoking Savior. Do we understand that? That everybody ought to be provoked when Jesus says, not only am I the only way to salvation, the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, but also when he says that you must bow the knee to me, that I am the Lord and Savior who rules and reigns over this earth. And so we see different reactions here in, uh, in Luke's gospel. So let's start reading there, Luke 23, verse 39. This is the word of the Lord for us today. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's God's word for us today. So 
I've heard this story literally my whole life, and maybe you have too. Maybe this is a brand new story for you. Um, even better, because we look at this story and we think, okay, here are two people who have two very uh, different and distinctive reactions to Christ. And I've always pictured one is the good thief and one is the bad thief. But even saying that out loud sounds weird, doesn't it? The good thief and the bad thief. But if we read just that part of the gospel, we think one already had the right kind of attitude, the right outlook, um, was in the right place in order to receive salvation from Jesus on that day. But I want to ask you, is that true? Is it good that this man had prepared himself for salvation on this day? Or was God doing something rather dramatic here, I think, to teach us something? So let's dive into that. First of all, who were these thieves? We get a little bit of information. They're mentioned in three different Gospels. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all mention these thieves. And here's what we can surmise, even from what we just read there in Luke's gospel. First is that these were men who were guilty and deserved to die for their sins. You'll read a lot about what the word thieves or robbers or however it may be translated in your, in your Bible that you may be reading is that these weren't just petty thieves. These were hardened criminals. In fact, a lot of people, the word that's used there probably means they were part of organized crime, we might call it today. That they were repeat offenders and probably really taking advantage of vulnerable people. A lot of people think they're the, the robbers and thieves out on the byways and highways that we read about in the parable of the Good Samaritan that would prey upon vulnerable travelers and would beat them and steal um, all their things. And so they're guilty, not because the Romans said they were guilty, um, I don't know how perfect their justice system was, but did you catch? They admit, or at least the one says, we did what they said we did. Did you catch that he said that? We are justly getting what we deserve here. He says, um, he rebuked his fellow thief there. Do you not fear God since we are under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. So they know that they're guilty um, of what they are accused of. But secondly, um, they knew the claims of Jesus. And so I hope there's some instruction to us here. Just knowing what Jesus said about himself is not saving faith. Knowing about Jesus is very different and falls very short of trusting in Jesus, of who he was and what he did. Because they both seem to know who he was, and yet one of them here in Luke's gospel mocks him for it. Didn't you say you were the Christ? Why don't you save yourself? And us, by the way, I like that he throws that in. Like, well, and while you're doing that, I wouldn't mind if you saved me too. But we're meant to read that. It was written for us to know that he was mocking Jesus, very certainly. One of the criminals saying, are you not the Christ? Very sarcastically, very mockingly. But here's what may be surprising. It's not just the one. We actually are told that they reviled Jesus. And why do I say they? Um, and you don't have to turn there um, necessarily if you want, but in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel, we're told that both of these thieves reviled Jesus. Matthew 27, 44 says, And the robbers, plural, who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. In the Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 32, it says, Those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now, what does reviled mean? I don't know about you, that's not a very common word today, is it? Well, let me just give you um, just a hint at what it means. There's the Greek word for reviled, and it's pronounced blasphemeo. I bet you can guess what reviled means if I said the Greek word is blasphemeo. It means they blast 
blasphemed God. But even more than that, I'll give you a fuller definition, to speak in a disrespectful way that demeans, that denigrates, that maligns and mocks, slander or defame. And what, who was doing that? Both of these thieves. And so I think Luke's gospel gets us to the end of the encounter where Matthew and Mark are pointing out that both of these criminals, both of these thieves hung on either side of Jesus were blaspheming, mocking, and maligning Jesus' character. And although Luke only puts those words on one of the thieves' tongue, we're to assume from the other two gospels, at some point during that crucifixion, both of them were doing such things. Now here's an amazing thought when we we think about this. So there's two thieves on either side mocking, reviling, blaspheming Jesus. And when Jesus is taunted, when he's reviled by these guilty sinners, he stayed on the cross. You ever been provoked into something? You knew you could do it, but I'm not going to do it. But if somebody pushes you far enough, I will show you right now. Don't you think in his human nature that Jesus had that passing thought? Jesus could have pulled his hands from those nails. He could have come down off of that cross. He could have struck both of those criminals mocking him dead. He could have struck the soldiers and all the people who were responsible for all that was going on there. We know the power that was demonstrated there, earthquakes and resurrections, the power was available to Jesus and yet he stayed on the cross. It's only by Jesus remaining, now think about this, it's only by Jesus remaining on that cross that these same revilers of Jesus have any hope of their salvation. William Booth said they claimed they would believe if he came down. I don't know if the thieves do that, but we're going to read in a minute. Lots of other people were mocking Jesus, even passers-by, And they say, why don't you save yourself and come down if you're the Christ? As if he came down from the cross, they would have believed. But William Booth says they claimed they would have believed if he came down. We believe because he stayed on the cross. Love kept him there. Have we considered that? That there weren't a lot of people there at the cross. In fact, almost none of Jesus' vast following just a few days before remained there at the cross. There wasn't anybody there that had any vision to say Jesus was doing something that is providing me for eternal life. There was nothing but defeat and mostly there was reviling and mocking of Jesus and yet he stayed there. And why is that? The Apostle Paul tells us that Christ died for the ungodly. I hope you know that today. I hope you know when we describe these thieves that these were men who were guilty, that that's a description of us. If we say, who did God die for? Who did he send his own son to die for? I hope you can say me because that's the faith that we need, but I also also hope you understand he died for the guilty, the ungodly, that those mocking him were the very people for which Jesus was dying for their sins. And you know this verse, I hope Romans 5, 8, uh, uh, 6 through 8 starts with Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. We know that. The people we love and are in good standing with, we might sacrifice ourselves in a moment of necessity for their lives. But here's what Jesus did. God showed his love. Remember, Jesus was on that cross because of God's great love. He showed us that love in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Jesus wasn't on that cross hoping that somebody next to him might appreciate it in the moment and even ask for it in the moment, thank him for it in the moment. Christ died for the ungodly. And maybe these two thieves are the quintessential example of that, that they were blasphemers, people who were totally rejecting Jesus. And had Jesus come down from the cross, would that have changed Jesus? 
their minds, maybe, but it wouldn't have changed their heart. You see, if Jesus would have come down from that cross, their sin, their debt, would not have been paid. You see, why did Christ die for the ungodly? Because it was the only way that they would experience eternal life with God. Their sins had to be paid for. Jesus is a sacrifice of atonement. And all their thinking of what Jesus should have been, should have been this royal military figure that would come down off this cross and vanquish all the enemies. But in God's providence, he was a suffering savior who would give himself for the sins of the world. And so what was happening in this encounter was these two thieves, the reviled, rejected, and blasphemed Savior continues his mission even to those who currently despise and reject him. Do we get that? That Jesus died for people? That even today there are people who live much of their lives who despise, reject, and revile who Jesus is, and yet Jesus' death can be effective for their salvation. And so, what changes in the midst of that? We'll come to that in just a second. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. Um, and I want to look at um, a, a bigger picture. Now we're going to kind of widen the lens out from the cross a little bit and see how many people that Matthew describes for us who were mocking Jesus. In fact, I'm reading from the ESV. The title um, over this little section of scripture is Jesus is Mocked. Here's what Matthew says in chapter 27, starting with verse 27. It starts with the soldiers. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and they took the reed and struck him on the head. When they had mocked him, they stripped, off, uh, stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled him to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. You see, the soldiers did everything they could possibly think of to humiliate, to mock and revile, to blaspheme the Son of God, the Savior for them. It goes on, verse 37, and over his head they put the charge against him which read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. We see how much irony there is in that for us. He literally was the king of the Jews. They thought it was just a claim. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And then here's people joining in the mocking and reviling of Jesus. Verse 39, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from this cross. You see, they had Jesus in their own minds, in their own image of what a Savior would be, and it was not this. And so they mocked him, saying, come down and save yourself. Finally, uh, then we get the, the religious leaders uh, began to mock him. Verse 41, so also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. You see, people have never liked that Jesus made those claims. 
in those who lived closest to him and even those who live 2,000 years now later do not want to believe. In fact, they will mock not only Jesus himself, but his people who would dare to say he is the Savior, he is the Son of God because he died and is gone forever. But we know that that resurrection is shortly to follow. And then finally we read again, verse 44, the robbers that now join in who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. What does all this mean? It means that people, even before this moment, there were many who mocked and reviled Jesus. God sent his son into the world, John chapter 1 says, and the world did not accept him. Jesus has been rejected by some throughout all eternity. And even before the time of Jesus, there were always people who, although they knew the reality of God, have rejected faith in God. But here's the good news. Here's what this can mean. If one of those revilers, those blasphemers of Jesus was saved on that day, it means that Jesus never stops seeking and saving the lost. In literally his last moments on earth, he is still seeking and saving the lost. If we want to be followers of Jesus, then when people revile us, because Jesus says, if you follow in my footsteps, you will suffer similar fate at times. What do we do? We still hold out hope because he is a seeking, a saving Jesus. And he is a provoking Jesus. Is that it's meant to elicit a response when Jesus says, I am the only way to salvation. There is none beside me. Some people say, how dare you? And other people will point out the shortcomings and the failings of God's people, and yet it doesn't change the reality of God. It doesn't change the grace of God. And so here in this moment, we're reminded when Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost, I really meant that. And even in the most horrible moment of his earthly life, he demonstrates that he's still seeking and he's still saving. And then to go with that, it tells us that no one, no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. Can we ever think of two people, and particularly the one that Jesus promises today, you'll be with me in paradise, in the pivotal moment in history when the Son of God, who had lived a perfectly righteous life, is giving himself as a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the world that this man mocked Jesus and shook his fist at God and made fun of what was going on there of this suffering servant of God. Can we think of anybody else that we would say justifiably should have continued in his suffering and his death for all eternity that would mock the Son of God in that moment and yet the grace of God breaks through? One person says, according to Matthew and Mark, both men were mocking Jesus, both reviling him, both used their remaining dying energy to hurl verbal insult upon the only man who could save them. But in an instant, grace broke through. A blasphemer is now a disciple. A blasphemer is now a disciple. And as always... I think God provides these Gospels for us because in part, not the main thing, but we can always see ourselves in these encounters with Jesus. I hope you can see yourself as Zacchaeus or the woman at the well or the other people that Jesus comes in contact with. The blind, the deaf, the dead, all are in need of Jesus saving grace. And in this one thief, this one thief who recognizes in that moment that he goes apparently from the Gospels from one moment to the next, his heart, his outlook, his reception of Jesus has done a complete 180. And I hope you know, too, notice that nobody here comes up and knocks on the bottom of the cross and goes, could I share God's wonderful plan for your life with you? God does an instantaneous work in his heart where Jesus can say, today you will be with me in paradise. 
It's only the grace of God that leads to belief in the cross that can instantly transform a belligerent sinner into a man who repents and believes. The repentant suddenly began to see. And I want you to know that his vision changed because his heart changed, and his heart changed because God did a work. There's no other events we're told about there. It's all the work of God. And so now this man seems to suddenly know the justice due him. He knows, I'm a sinner. I deserve damnation. Just like we should know, I am a sinner. I deserve eternal damnation. He also recognizes the sinless nature of Jesus. Say, this man has done nothing wrong. I hope you know it's important to our salvation that Jesus was perfectly righteous because our salvation means that now we receive his righteousness when we stand before God. He recognizes him as the Son of God. In fact, I love that he calls him by his name, Jesus. You remember at the very beginning of Luke's gospel why they were told to call Jesus, Jesus? Mary and Joseph, that wasn't necessarily a family name or just one they liked or a popular name, although it may have been all those things. God, through an angel, told them, you shall call him Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. And I love that this blasphemer of God says Jesus, which by the way means Yahweh or God saves. Will you remember me today? He also seems to immediately recognize that now there is life beyond this life on earth. He says, remember me in your kingdom. And so he realizes Jesus is going somewhere and he wants to be with him there, which also means he believes that there is a kingdom beyond the cross and that Jesus is in fact the king. Let me close with this. Here's what Peter says about Jesus in those moments that he was reviled. 1 Peter 2, 23 through 25 says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed for you were straying like sheep. Before I finish, hear that part again. You were straying like sheep. You were a reviler, a blasphemer, a mocker of Jesus Christ, but now have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. That's the gospel there, is that God's grace overcomes our callous, evil, mocking lives before God. And he transforms us into disciples, and the work is God's work. So when we see this picture, I realize that probably for a lot of us here today, we feel like we live between the two mocking thieves. That maybe we grow weary of our Jesus being mocked, rejected, and reviled. But we hold him out as our only hope. When he's mocked, when he's reviled, when he's blasphemed, we just proclaim him as Lord and Savior, the perfect Son of God who's made the perfect sacrifice for our sins, who rules and reigns. And one day, someday, for so many people, the grace breaks through. A heart is changed, a life is brought into saving grace, to relationship with God. And sometimes it's when we least expect it. You see, Christ came into the world to save sinners. That's the gospel, and that's good news for us, and it's good news for the world. I hope you go out today with that good news. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for his suffering on our behalf, uh, that he gave his life as a ransom to pay the penalty for our sins. And we know that we live in a world that people scoff at the idea that we could be forgiven of sins or that we could receive a righteousness that's not our own. Uh, People mock the fact that we would bow our knee uh, to a resurrected Savior. And yet, 
your salvation demands that of us. Um, and so I pray that uh, each and every one of us will be provoked to uh, a reaction to Jesus' claims on our life. And I pray that we would come and acknowledge him as the Son of God, the Savior of sinners, that we, as sinners of God, our only hope is in Jesus Christ. Um, let us take that message with us as we go for, uh, from here today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.